finally, it's a weird time of 4.35, so we can officially start class. All right, let's go there. Um, let's say good morning, it's definitely not morning. It's definitely afternoon, it's almost night, so but saying good night is very weird. Uh, so, good evening. Yeah, it's probably like it's four. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, CSE 545. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. That is cool. And I see some new faces, and that's also really good. Uh, my apologies. I wasn't able to be here last week as I was telling some people. Um, the National Science Foundation, who funds my research, they said, hey, we need you to be in DC for three days. And I said, yes, because they fund my research. So. <laughs> you should have taught class there. It's a good lesson to learn from uh, for your careers. Somebody's paying you to do something and they ask you to be somewhere, you should be that place. Okay. Cool. Any questions before I start? I heard, um, I know there's a question about MCS project portfolios that I'm going to answer soon, but yes, this is an MCS portfolio class. I'll be put adding instructions to the syllabus. Anything else? Yes, we already decided on office hours. I need to post them. Yes. I don't feel like we necessarily need them yet, but we will we'll have them and we will be available. Anything else? All right. See if this works. Okay. So, as I hope you talked about on Monday, security, and specifically software security. So my philosophy when viewing this class is you need to understand what makes software insecure before you can even think about building secure software. And so that's really what we're going to explore in this class is what are all the ways essentially that software can break and how you either programmers make prob uh, have problems creating software, so there's vulnerabilities in the software themselves, how, how can maybe the software be misconfigured or misinstalled so that there can be vulnerabilities. And so we're actually, and in my mind, just at a high level, understanding about vulnerabilities is absolutely not enough. You need to actually put your theoretical knowledge to the test and actually craft and create exploits. Um, and so part of knowing where we are today in the state of security and computer security, <coughs> We have to look back at our past and try to understand, okay, how did we get to this point? Uh, does anybody feel like we live in the age of secure systems and secure computers? No, why not? Why don't you feel that way? There's major hacks every day. Yeah, major hacks every day, like kinds. Yahoo. Yahoo, there are multiple Yahoos. Yeah. <laughs> what other hacks? OPM data breach, so the, uh, for those of you that don't know, the Office of Personnel Management, I believe, was it last summer or the summer before? I think it's last summer, right? Uh, they were breached, so the Office of Personnel Management is, has all of the data on everybody, basically, in the military and in government agencies. So if that wasn't bad enough, getting all that private information, they also have all of the information from people who've ever applied for secret or any kind of clearance. So has anybody gone through the uh, process of getting clearance? So some people, yeah. So they ask a lot of personal questions and whoever hacked that OPM database now has access to all of these sensitive personal questions. I've only been on the outside, I've been interviewed for these questions and they ask me things like, is there anything that uh, this person could be blackmailed with, like are they, uh, are they loyal to the United States, like all these questions. You have your, you have to put all of your, every place you've ever lived, you have to put every place you've ever worked, all of your spouse, your children, all this information is in this one database and it got hacked and leaked. And so you think now somebody can, really has all this information, and not on random people, but on the people who we're entrusting with secrets. Question? No, no, no. Oh, I thought it was a lot of Sorry. Cool. So, 
in order to kind of look at where we are nowadays, right? Nowadays, I think you should, well, you shouldn't be too scared. Is anybody so scared of security that they're not using the internet? <laughs> <laughs> right? That seems insane, right, to think about. But you'd be a lot more secure if you were, but your life would probably be measurably, eh, probably worse, I guess we can say. <laughs> yeah, worse than a lot of it. So to understand where we are today, we need to look back at the history and try to understand how we got here. Um, and so, really, I mean, kind of the birth of computer security really started with the internet. And the internet, and I'm still going to capitalize the I in the internet probably until I die, uh, because I believe that is correct. Um, so the internet is really a network of networks, right? As opposed to an intranet, which is an internal network. Right? The internet is composed of networks of networks. So we each have our own network and we're talking to other organizations to try to wrap traffic. <coughs> it's a capital I because it's the, the internet, the one internet. Um, and this is the whole idea is, and we're gonna actually go into a lot of detail about networking and routing and how this stuff actually happens at the technical level. Uh, but for now, we can say that it's really, so we have uh, autonomous subnetworks. Right, so ASU, well, technically CenturyLink, because CenturyLink runs our network, but ASU owns a network space, right? But when we want to access Google.com, that doesn't exist in ASU's network, right? We need to go outside of ASU's network to get that information from Google.com, and we send us our results back. So really, the internet <coughs> is how all of these autonomous networks talk to each other. Uh, the beautiful thing is that it has a very open architecture, so all of the protocols are documented out in the open. So this actually is great from a student and educational perspective because you can study exactly how these things work. And in regards to security, you can actually study these things and look for vulnerabilities in them. And it's easier because these specifications are open. Um, and you have this interesting interplay. Uh, I believe it was Twitter that was taken down. I mean, Twitter's always been down every now and then, but uh, one of the ones no offense to anybody who's on Twitter. Um, one of the ones I remember is when another network accidentally started advertising routes for Twitter. And they said, yeah, yeah, we're Twitter. And so all Twitter's traffic went to this one network and nobody was able to actually go to Twitter. So this is part of the problem. So part of the issues with the internet are not just technical, right? Technically you have these independent entities, these independent networks. And so that creates a lot of political kinds of problems that can come up. And I think this is kind of just, you know, internet is really important. I don't know. That would be an interesting experiment, try living your life with no internet for a few days. You can probably do it for a few days, but for an extended period of time would be incredibly difficult. So the internet history. So the history of the internet. In the 70s, DARPA, the Defense, uh, I think it was the acronym, a Defense Advanced Research <coughs> Project Agency, created and funded what they called the ARPANET. And this was back, I mean, pretty you know, long time ago, 1969. They had four nodes on the internet. What were those four nodes? Universities. They were univers uh, three of them were universities. Yeah. Which ones? UCSB. UCSB was one. Stanford. What was that? Stanford. Stanford was two. Utah. What was that? Utah. University of Utah. Utah. University of Utah. Berkeley. And Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, no. Wait. <laughs> now we have to look. Okay. <laughs> I don't actually remember. This is a lot. This is a good guessing game. Uh, so UCLA was one. UC Santa Barbara, the Stanford Research Institute. I think Stanford was in there somewhere. Um, and so why was Utah added? Private. Hmm? It's private. Outside no. California. What was that? Outside California. In outside of California for political reasons, right? Because DARPA was funding money for this project. They didn't want to be seen as just dumping a bunch of money on California. So they included an organization that was outside of California. Probably a similar reason for SRI's inclusion because they're a private research institution and so they're not a university. So they got the not university diversity there. And one of the coolest things I love always looking at is this is the connection. So this is the four nodes of the ARPANET which eventually became the internet. And this is the systems that they were running on this network. Right? So it's actually, it kind of blows my mind to think about where we are today with literally every one of your cell phones and laptops 
is accessing the internet and talking on the internet and accessing all these services. And it started here with these four nodes. Right? Pretty cool. Uh, and the original networking protocol that they used uh, was called the network control protocol. We'll see why it's important in a second. So in the 70s, it was very much a research thing. Right? So this is just something that researchers used. They were trying to prove that you could have computers and machines talk to each other uh, over these networks. In the 80s, they had, uh, so people that are familiar with networking probably know this. In 1983, they had what's called Flag Day. So basically, everyone using the internet at that point decided, you know what, NCP is not very good. And I'll be honest, I don't remember exactly why. Uh, we're going to move to TCP and IP. And so they all decided on this day to shut down all their computers, <coughs> install the updates to update the operating systems to use TCP, and then brought everything back up. Could you do this nowadays? No. No. Think about how insane of a task that would be. They could actually, I've actually seen, the, oh, I should bring a picture. Uh, one of the professors at UCSB had a phone book, it's about this thick, I believe it was from the 80s, of the internet. So you look through there, it's IP addresses, user uh, administrator names, and phone numbers for every machine that was on the internet. So yeah, you could actually organize this, right? You could call people and say, yeah, you know, there's this really big problem, we need to upgrade the network. Okay, when do you want to shut down the internet? Like, <laughs> <laughs> if you try to do this now, it would be insane. I, I just, I, it's hard for me to envision a scenario where the world comes together and decides to upgrade the internet. So why is that important? Because you have to build up the current framework. Yes, this means we're stuck with basically TCP or IP, right? So if you want to propose a new alternative, you say, oh, I have a much better way of routing packets. Uh, it better be backwards compatible with one of these two protocols, or depending on what layer. But it has to be back, back, backwards compatible with these protocols, otherwise it's a non-starter. Yeah. The importance of especially the TCP IP over uh, the network control protocol is that NCP was uh, based on like network stability, so there was like a centralized node and that went down the internet would break, whereas this stability is based individually on the hosts. Interesting. If one host goes down, the whole internet is Cool. Yeah, that's, uh, I did not know that. So yeah. Um, one great thing we've learned collectively from the internet and networks is having a central point of failure is always a bad idea in terms of scalability, right? So, yeah, if NCP was using some kind of centralized routing mechanism or something, that would be uh, definitely a non-starter. Uh, so, also in the 80s, the impact thing is DARPA funds the development of Berkeley Unix, and they, as part of that, their TCP IP stack kind of became the standard for open source software that was used by a lot of and then finally, we actually had this evolution. Instead of ARPANET just being researchers being paid to create this, organizations started to realize that, oh man, this internet thing actually is useful. Like being able to send an email from one machine to another is very nice. Um, and so MILNET is the military network. So it used, to, I guess it used to be a part of ARPANET and has since split into its own network. So they have very different ways of doing things, which I am not familiar with, not being involved with that. Um, this is, I like this fact. Uh, the NSF created a network for supercomputers, right? Fast, pushing huge amounts of bandwidth and data that had a 56 kilobit <laughs> per second length. This is, for anyone that remembers dial-up modems, that's how fast this was. But this was like supercomputer level of fast internet communication. Okay, in the 90s and in the 2000s is when things start to explode. Uh, you have incredibly high growth, not only in the size of data that's being sent across the internet, but also in the volume. Um, and I love this date because my background is on web applications, so I'm a huge sucker for web applications. So in 1991, Tim Berners-Lee at CERN created essentially the World Wide Web as we know it. So this is actually an important concept that we'll come back to later. But the World Wide Web, as we, we actually think of that, a lot of us, as the internet, right? You 
the internet is you open up a browser and you go to Google and you search for something. Or you use Bing uh, and search for something. Um, and so, but really, uh, there's actually the World Wide Web is just one protocol that is used on the internet. Um, other famous ones, so email predates the web by a significant significant margin. You have SSH, Telnet, and any of those other ports and services that we'll all look at, these are all different protocols that use the internet to communicate. Um, and so the web is kind of just one subset, but it was a subset that made it explode and made the internet basically usable for everyone. Um, so the internet explodes. So how, what kind of an explosion? So we went from, let's look at this. So this is number of websites from 1999, which is already eight years after the web was created. And it's about at the six million mark here, give or take. So that's actually in itself. If you create something, oh, is that true now, Dave? Yeah, probably. If you create something that in six years has six million people, wait, is that six years? No, not even. eight years that has six million people using it, you're probably doing something right. And if you can extend that out to so you can look here in 1991, no, no, oh yeah, so this is 1990, Tim Berners-Lee had the first single <coughs> website, right? And you can see over time it slowly grew into the hundreds. Imagine how cool that would be, your Tim Berners-Lee. You know, like I create something that like hundreds of people are using. Um, and then it turns into this thing that literally millions, if billions of people are using. And so it's kind of an interesting little bit of side note about why the internet was created. So Tim Berners-Lee was working on basically, I don't know, I think it was the equivalent of, he was working at CERN, which is the uh, European organization doing, their big thing now is the LHC, right, the Large Hadron Collider. And so their big problem was, hey, we have all these researchers doing research, but it's really difficult to know who's working on what and where, even where people are at one time. So he was like, oh, it's great if you could have this like, page with the people here, and you can click all of these links to take you to their page so you can see what they're working on. So that was kind of the origin of the web. Yes? Any reason why the number of websites could go down by that much? Probably just the measurement uh, study. It's actually difficult. It would be hard to kind of, unless you're Google, you probably don't know. It's <laughs> my guess. Yes? My, my question was about uh, what are you saying as a website? Is that something that talks HTTP? I do not know. Uh, you have to, I think if you, I'm pretty sure if you follow this link, they have much better methodology of how they actually measure that. But yeah, that's one thing, right? Is it something talking HTTP? Or, or, or are we talking um, <coughs> DNS that resolves because you have multiple hosts that are on one IP? You have the reverse, so Google has a bunch of IPs that if you ask them for google.com, they'll give you back google.com. So yeah, I don't know exactly how they do this, but um, I think we can all agree it's, significantly increase from one or even six million uh, websites. So I like this visualization, it kind of shows, this is a visualization, you can look at the lower left here, of uh, different networks and the amount of traffic they're all sending over the, sending all over the place. Uh, this is kind of conveying that it's a crazy, the internet is a crazy place with lots of things happening, right? And this is part of the reason why it can be so difficult to actually detect an attack. A lot of networks have lots of things going on. Um, the interesting thing I learned recently about ASU, so if you think about it from a network management standpoint, every year about, let's say, a quarter of our users leave the ASU network, and we get a brand new quarter of users, right? So when students graduate, we get new students coming in. So now you have this, what, how many, we say 100,000, so that's like about 20,000 students, new users on your network every year. Whereas in an organization, you don't have that, right? Your turnover is probably like 5%, maybe. Um, so ASU itself has to deal with a lot of these challenges. So how do, and we have people who are thinking about how do we make sure that your guys' laptops are secure when you're talking to the ASU network, right? How do we make sure that somebody else's laptop isn't trying to infect your machine? So the internet's really big. So that's one aspect of why so now with the internet, we kind of have this global worldwide reach. And so now I want to look at the hack, the history of hacking. So I'm going to skip over this as like just overview. 
So we're going to get into this, but it can actually, a lot of this can be traced back, and a lot of actually hacking culture can be traced back to in 1972. So in 1972, there's a guy named John Draper. His name, they called him Captain Crunch, which is a super cool name. Uh, part of that reason is because he found a whistle that came for free in Captain Crunch cereal, produced a sound at 2600 hertz frequency. So why is this frequency important? Dial tone. Dial tone. What about a dial tone? What's a, what's a dial tone? I don't use a cell phone. Uh, so it would make a noise, have like a series of noises, and then that would determine where you were going to call to, I guess? That yeah, was like so control. back in the, think of the days of landline, right? You would pick up a phone and you would hear the smah, which made you off sound at that time. <laughs> um, and then you call a number. What you're actually doing is sending a signal to the router that's basically an AT&T saying, hey, I want to call this number, and then they would call something else. So it turns out that 2600 frequency was used by AT&T to authorize long distance calls. So I also know it may be impossible to believe. Back in the day, you couldn't call any number at any time for free. You could only call local numbers for free, and you had to pay per minute to call somebody in a different uh, area code. And the way that they would do that is, essentially, the phone lines would emit this frequency kind of over the voice channels to tell people that this was an authorized long distance call. And so this, along with other things, led to the birth of what's called phone freaking. Uh, and the idea there was, let's make phone calls for free, because we can essentially trick the phone network into thinking that we're making this call for free. So part of that was that sound, that the sound of that 2600 would do a certain thing uh, and let you in. And so he discovered this, and then he built a blue box. And what this blue box did was basically had different buttons on it that would allow you to have different dial tones and different tones. So then information would proliferate about, oh, and you could uh, you do crazy things like bounce your call like across the world before connecting to somewhere else, all using these little devices. Um, his story is actually kind of sad. Uh, he was sentenced to five years probation for phone fraud. Um, and the question, though, is why do we care? Why do we care about Captain Crunch, besides it being uh, a very cool name? <laughs> <laughs> he exploded what? <laughs> yeah, so he, he basically was taking advantage of a vulnerability in the phone network. Um, that vulnerability being hey, maybe the switches and, and servers or whatever, well, they're not servers, but maybe the switches shouldn't be talking to people through the same line that you're sending voice data on. Right? That voice data should always send voice data. You shouldn't ever interpret that as commands like make this call for free. And so that really kicked it off. There's actually, there's a whole, if you want to, I bet the Wikipedia, I haven't read it, but I've read other articles. The Wikipedia article for this is probably really good. Um, there's a whole culture about phone freaking. Um, they found out that some people could actually do the frequencies just by whistling. And so they would be like natural born phone freakers. <laughs> <laughs> they actually would like explore the network. So they like, you know, and they're on the outside. So they had to reverse engineer a lot of how the phone networks were working. And so they do that. They basically compile all this knowledge about how the phone network sometimes more than the AT&T employees themselves. Um, and so yeah, it's a very interesting mix of kind of this. And this is really one of the starts of hacking culture is this phone freaking. Um, so moving on a little bit more up to date and more kind of in the vein of what security we're talking about. So in 1973, uh, we had Bob Met Metcalf. Cow uh, wrote an RFC. So what's an RFC? Somebody want to go? Instead of mumbling, all along. Yeah. A request for comment. A request for comment. What's what is it used for? Standard. Standard. Standards. Yeah. So this is kind of the way that if you want to standardize something on the internet, the typical way, and there's a whole process now, is you submit an RFC. So all of the DNS is defined through this. Uh, email, you know, SMTP. 
So HTTP protocols are all defined on there, IP, everything, TCP, everything's in an RFC. Uh, and so I really like this quote from this RFC that he wrote. So the title may give you a hint that it's not actually a protocol. It's called The Stockings Were Hung, <coughs> hung by the Chimney with Care. And he states, the ARPANET computer network is susceptible to security violations for at least three following reasons. One, individual sites used to physical limitations on machine access have not yet taken sufficient precautions towards securing their systems against unauthorized remote use. For example, many people still use their passwords, which are easy to guess. Their first names, their initials, their host names spelled backwards, a string of characters are easy to type in sequence. Why is that string of characters easy to type in sequence? It's not the keyboards. Yeah, at the bottom row of the QWERTY keyboard. Is this still a problem? <coughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, it's been a problem since 1973. It's still a problem in 2017. Okay, some more things. Uh, the TIP allows access to the ARPANET in a much wider audience than is thought or intended. Uh, TIP phone numbers are posted like those scribbled hastily on the walls of phone booths on, and men's restrooms. Huh. <laughs> uh, the TIP required no user identification before giving service. Thus, many people, including those who used to spend their time ripping off Ma Bell, who is he talking about there? Uh, yeah, the phone freakers. He's talking about the phone freakers and uh, Captain Crunch. Uh, get access to our stockings in a most anonymous way. So the TIP was how you could get access to these systems remotely. So it allowed you to kind of call into these systems. Um, and so they're saying, like, nobody's securing these numbers. And once they call this number, they have access to our system. Right? So there's no way to authenticate who's actually calling this number. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, there's lingering af affection for the challenge of breaking someone's system. This affection lingers despite the fact that everyone knows that it's easier to break systems, even easier to crash them. Is that true? Let's kind of pick it apart. So is there still a lingering <coughs> affection for the challenge of breaking someone's system? Yes. Why? What is it about it that makes it cool? You accomplish something that no one else can do. Ooh, you accomplish something that no one else can do? Is it actually the act of breaking into their computers? I, mean, I don't know. For me, that really it's more of like a criminal motive, right? You talk about somebody else's computer. Uh, fundamentally, I look at it in two ways. A, but kind of like forcing a system to do something that it wasn't designed to do, right? And that requires intense knowledge of that system, right? And that's kind of how I see those phone freakers relating, right? They had to learn knowledge about how this system works in the phone system so that they could attempt to make, you know, they could do what they want with the system that at and didn't want them to do. Similarly with security vulnerabilities, right? For me, finding a vulnerability and exploiting vulnerability proves that you have a very deep knowledge of that system and how it works. So I don't think that ever goes away. That, that's part of why we study this in an academic setting, right? We need to study how to break things, not because we want to be criminals, and we're going to talk about ethics in the next section, uh, but because we want that knowledge. We want that deep understanding of the system so, so complete that we can make it do whatever we want. And it's a very powerful feeling. Uh, is it easy to break systems and easy to crash them? now, so mm. uh, crashing a system is probably more difficult than exploiting it. And you think, so this was written in 1973, so he says everyone knows that it's easier to break, that it's easy to break systems. So in 1973, who was using the ARPANET? Researchers. Yeah, researchers and like people whose lives are computers, right? These are the experts of the experts. So yeah, they all know, but is that true statement maybe true nowadays? I don't think, 
And so defenses have gotten better, right, over time. So I'd say, if you're talking about how easy was it to break into 1973 software versus 2017, you could make a very solid case that it's more difficult for 2017 for certain cases. Um, there's still some things that are very easy, especially on the web, um, especially if you're not trying to target a certain one, if you're just trying to exploit somebody on the internet, right? The internet is very large, odds are you will be able to exploit somebody. Okay, let's see what else he does. So he says, all of this would be quite humorous and cause for uh, raucous, is that how you pronounce that word? <laughs> raucous eye winking and elbow nudging. Uh, it weren't for the fact that in recent weeks at least two major serving hosts were crashed under suspicious circumstances by people who knew what they were risking. On yet a third system, the system wheel passwords, so back in the day, wheel was the same as root. Uh, the system root password or administrator password, since we only that, uh, was compromised <laughs> by two high school students in Los Angeles, no less. Uh, we suspect that the number of dangerous security violations is larger than any of us know is growing. You are advised not to sit in the hope that St. Nicholas would soon be here. So what is he trying to achieve with this? Awareness. Awareness. He's trying to wake people up and say, look, you can't, you have to start thinking that people are going to try to attack your systems, right? Back in the day, we saw that dagger. There were four nodes on the ARPANET. All four people knew each other, right? It's not like they didn't know there was some stranger on the internet, right? The, the ARPANET at the time. And so he's trying to tell the community, hey, wake up, we've got to do something about this. So this was kind of the first early warnings in the process that, hey, we should start thinking about security. If we don't think about it, it's going to cause problems, which, spoiler alert, it did. Okay. This is. Actually, all of these are my favorites. That's why I'm talking about them, so I shouldn't say which one is my favorite. This one I really like, uh, also because there's a book written about it that you can read about. Uh, I'll link it in the end. Uh, so the German hacker incident, this sounds like a really cool movie. Right? Uh, so Cliff Stoll was a system administrator at Lawrence uh, Berkeley Lab. Wait, Lawrence Berkeley? Is it more Berkeley? LBL, anybody know? The Livermore Berkeley Lab. Okay, that's what it was. Uh, in August 1986. So he was actually a physics student. So he was not a computer scientist. His background was not, there wasn't even a, really a concept or area of security really back then. So he was not a security person. He was just a grad student who got tasked with maintaining the physics department's server. And so on his first day, he noticed a 75 cent accounting discrepancy for CPU time. So back on these big uh, systems, right, every, we buy, you buy a big computing system, you have multiple user accounts, and you have to pay for time that you were using there. Um, so it's actually kind of funny, right, because it used to be that's an insane way to think about computing, because you just buy your own desktop and that'd be it, you wouldn't pay anybody for it. But now we have cloud things like Amazon, where now you, we've gone back to paying for the hour for compute time. Um, so that's an interesting development here. So 75 cents. So can you honestly say that if you started your job and you noticed a 75 cent difference, that you would investigate the cause of that? I would probably not. I would start off. I would probably not. Right? So 75 cents, especially, did somebody do inflation calculator from 86 to now and 75 cents? Like five dollars now, maybe something. So, and he found out when he started digging into this that an account had been created with no billing address, so the billing software couldn't bill them any money. And this should start raising red flags, right? So maybe you ignore, don't notice the seventy-five cent discrepancy. Maybe you put it off till later because you're busy. Once you find out there's an account created with no billing address, then you start digging. So he started digging and he found the presence of an intruder. So he found that somebody had broken into their system and had created this account and had given them remote access and they had a backdoor access. Um, so he freaked out and he basically <coughs> called uh, the FBI and several other agencies to try to track <laughs> this person. And basically they had him essentially set up a tap on the network. So he set up this crazy system where he got a page 
text, you can say, uh, if you know what that is. Uh, he got a page uh, whenever he, whenever the attacker logged on, so he could run down, uh, ride down on his bike, and like start the tap software. So it would do printouts of everything we, that person was typing. Um, and so using this, he monitored the intruder and was able to find out who they were and how they gained access. So it turns out it was a configuration problem in Emacs, which is an editor that was installed on these systems. Um, and you know, Emacs, as people like to claim, will do everything. So it can work as a, ma a mailer, so it can use the move mail program to move a user's email where they're stored in our school to their home directory, how that would be. Um, and the administrators there had configured it saying, oh, move mail should have root administrator privilege. It should be able to do everything, right? It's got to move mail around. Uh, well, it turns out that this opens up a security hole, which now MoveMail allowed anyone in the system to move files to any directory. So anybody can move any files anywhere they want. Um, so he exploited this bug to basically substitute his own copy of the at run program, which is ran every, I can't remember how much, but every, let's, we'll say, hour. Um, and so after, so what that program did is after it was executed, it would copy the old at run program back thus covering its traces, and then would create the fake user account. So using that, he was able to get administrative access to the server. He created those fake accounts with no billing addresses. He created a backdoor program. Um, and this is where it takes an interesting turn. He used this system to connect to military systems on the military network. So this was back when the ARPANET and the military net were on the same system. And the LBL lab was doing a lot of government research, right? So they were working with military organizations. And his research found, so remember, once, so you gotta think, the attacker's coming, it connects to his system, and so he can see every command that's being sent. And then he can see it connect to that remote system. So that remote system sees a connection from his system, but Cliff can still see all the traffic that's being sent to that other system. So he was able to see that he would try to probe other uh, remote military systems. He, when he would break into them, because a lot of times they'd use the default password, they would, and then he would search for things such as SDI, Stealth, SAC, Nuclear, NORAD on the systems, and would siphon down all that data. Um, and so this is kind of the point where he called the FBI, he would use like in over his head. So, with the help of the FBI and the German uh, agency, uh, he was able to trace the intruder to Hanover, and finally in 1989, they actually arrested somebody who was working for the Eastern Bloc trying to get information about the US. Um, and he was sentenced to a year and eight months, and I have no idea how much money that is now, it's impossible to tell, uh, I mean it's not impossible. Um, and so they found similar uh, attackers that were involved in this break-in. So this is kind of, you know, you find you're, you're like this uh, physics student who like stumbles across this international hacking espionage campaign. Like that's pretty cool. That's like, I think it's, it kind of is straight out of a movie. So he wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg. It's his own account, so he wrote it. It's his own account of the incident, so you can hear him describe this firsthand. I highly recommend this. It's a really, even if you already know the ending, because I just spoiled it for everyone, um, it's still a really good book, so I highly recommend this. So this is kind of a good first example of really kind of getting to the level of nation state hacking, right? Where now we have big government agencies. And that's one of the things I put noted in his book was this person wasn't doing random things. They were methodically going through server by server and then trying all bunch, a lot of exploits that they had for that, and then if they didn't get any access, they'd move on. And they would keep creating accounts there. Yeah. What's the East Block? What's the what? East Block. Or oh, uh, East Germany, West Germany, when they used to be two different countries. Yeah. They used to be two different countries. So, so East Block is East Germany? Yes, right? yes, East Germany. Sorry, we're getting a lot of history here. Okay, 
So then the next really notable in in incident was the internet worm. So in 1988, the it's called the internet worm because apparently it was the first one, so you have to call it that. You have to name other things, other things. Um, was developed by a student who had a very cool hacker alias of RTM, uh, Robert Tappan Morris. He released it. And so what is a worm? Does anybody know what a worm is? Yeah, so it's a piece of software. It takes advantage of a vulnerability, so it will scan the network, find other computers that are vulnerable to the same vulnerability, exploit that vulnerability, copy itself over to that machine, and run on that machine to then scan all the machines that that one can find to copy itself. So in this way, it spreads throughout the network, basically like an infection, like a viral infection. So there's a lot of debate, and I won't go into it, about did he deliberately do this? Was it accidental? Was he just developing this for fun and it kind of escaped him and got out of hand? Um, I believe his, well, I don't think that. Uh, you can look up more stuff about this. Um, so it turns out what happened was the, a mistake in the replication procedure led to basically unexpected proliferation. So the idea would be when you scan other systems, if you've already exploited that system and you've taken it over, why would you want to retake it over? <coughs> Um, unfortunately, he had a bug in his code when he was checking for that, and so machines would continually get infected with this worm. So, now remember, this isn't your laptops or servers nowadays where we have 64 cores and 32 gigs of RAM, right? We have very limited CPU power, very limited memory, and you're trying to run now tens or 15 or 20 of these worm programs would just bring the computer to a grinding halt and nothing could happen. And so how they fixed it, they <laughs> turned everything off. Because what would happen is they'd try to patch it and then they'd bring it back up and it would just get exploited right away and things, and things were getting crazy, like you couldn't even use the computers to talk about this problem, right? They had to actually physically call people. Uh, and so they basically were like, shut everything down, everyone patch everything, and then we'll bring everything back up and it'll finally stop. Um, and so, yeah, so damages were estimated to be on the order of several hundred thousand dollars. So if we turned the internet off for a day, damages would be several hundred thousand dollars. No. Can anybody even come up with a reasonable estimate? I don't think so. I don't think you can be high enough. Maybe. I mean, maybe if you're talking a couple trillion, that'd be outrageous, but a billion, I think, is not unreasonable in the amount of productivity loss and business loss. I mean, it would just be insane. So, the story of RTM is that he was sentenced to three years probation, a $10,000 fine, and 400 hours of community service. Jeez. What do you think? Is this reasonable? I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> not, not a lawyer. You're a person, though. You can get about it. Yeah. I think back then it was probably reasonable in the, in the sense that You can always claim you don't really know what's going to happen when you do this because you're the first person that's ever done it. The second person to write a worm should know better, uh, right? And so, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I can see both sides. Uh, one of the important things that was created as a direct response of this result, what they realized is, you know, once you as an administrator found yourself under attack and all your machines are down, what do you do? Like, there's nobody to talk to. There's nobody to, you can maybe talk to other administrators, but what they created was an organization called CERT, uh, which is the Computer Emergency <laughs> Response Team, who their job is basically, they will disclose vulnerabilities, they will raise alerts when there are problems in the internet. Uh, you can go to them if you find a problem, they will help you uh, fix it and notify affected parties. Uh, so they've kind of become the place for talking about, so that now basically as a community, we have this place that we can go to to talk about these things. Digging into the worm a little bit, because it's very cool from a technical standpoint. 
Um, so as we talked about, learn self-replicating program. Uh, it worked only on Sun 3 systems and Vax computers running BSD Unix. Uh, the worm had two parts, it was really cool. It had a main program and a bootstrap program. Uh, so first it would get, and actually so, this is when you start like digging into this, you're like, huh, this was pretty sophisticated. Like, it wasn't just like a complete accident where you're just coding something for fun. Uh, use multiple vulnerabilities to exploit these systems. Uh, so there was an exploit in the finger daemon. So this, before poking, there was a finger service, which basically would give you information about a user. So if you want to know about user Adam D at ASU.com, you can say uh, finger Adam D at ASU.com. <laughs> 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 return the information that I had publicly about like who I was or whatever. Um, so there's a buffer overflow there. There, uh, It's pretty classic, we'll get into this later, but very classic, just get all of the line that's sent from finger uh, from the remote connection and then pop an overflow. Uh, there's a bugging send mail, which was a mail send command. It, you know, had a debug option, which sounds great if you're trying to administer send mail. Anybody administer a send mail system? Yeah, is it fun? No, it's horrible. Seven mils configuration is awful. I'm sure it wasn't any different back in 88. Um, and so they had a debug option. So if you're remote and you're trying to interact with the system, you could say, oh, debug this and specify the exact command to run. Well, there's no authentication there. Nobody knows who you are. So you could just connect to that and say, hey, run this command and it would execute this command. Once it, so it had two vulnerabilities. Once it exploited one of these vulnerabilities, it trans, uh, translated a bootstrap program, which was 99 lines of C, which is actually kind of crazy to think about, but this is how you can get really a cross-platform worm, right? Instead of sending over a binary, he sent over a C program, compiled that program, ran it, and then that would cause the main program to be transferred over depending on which version it was. Which is pretty sophisticated. I mean, even doing this on your own is kind of tricky. Like now it is. So the main program, right? So the worm needs to spread. So that was the infection vector, and now it has to spread. So the first part, it gathered information about all the network interfaces that were currently in use and all the current open connections. So what computers, what IPs are we already connected to? And then it would try to just use the finger vulnerability, the send mail vulnerability, or what's RSH? Remote shell, so it's the precursor to SSH. So this has is exactly like SSH, but without the S. What's the first S in SSH stand for? Secure. Secure. Yes. So it, this was sending everything in the clear. And oftentimes, what people had back then is they knew, like we know now, having passwords suck, right? I mean, it gets in the way of doing things. So they would set up relationships between machines. Like, oh, if I'm the admin on this machine, if I RSH into this other machine. I can just RSH into the admin because I'm the admin here, I need to be the admin over here. And so the worm took advantage of these trust relationships. Uh, so it would try to just RSH into these servers to see if we get in. It would also basically perform reconnaissance on the system it was on to try to find out who were these trusted hosts. So it would read basically the etc host file, uh, the r host file, which is a list of remote hosts. A forward file, which is how your email gets forwarded from one machine to the other, and then it would try to RSH into those things. Um, it would also perform a password cracking attack. So it would try to crack the passwords of users locally. Yeah, but, you know, the more you learn about this, you're like, oh, this is, this is pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, and on each so the problem then was on each successful break in, the bootstrap was transferred, right? And then a new version of the worm would get executed, and then it would keep spreading. And this was even a problem even for machines you know, that weren't, weren't necessarily vulnerable. Even if you have a machine that's not vulnerable, if everybody else's machine is vulnerable with 10 copies of this worm, they're trying to connect to every machine on the network. It's just going to bring your machine down, too. Uh, so that's why they need this coordinated effort. Any questions on this? I really like this one. This one's a cool one. Cool. So uh, there's another link here for more information about the internet worm and the worm. Uh, it's super, really interesting stuff. I think and a lot of this stuff is still relevant, right? Password cracking, 
just like we saw in the RFC, right? Users choose terrible passwords. It's like, it seems to be a fundamental fact of computing and security. Okay, next up on our list, Kevin Mitnick. So anybody know this name? What's his name? Some people. So he was actually one of the first, well, one of the most well-known hackers. Um, so in 1982, he had a one, a one year probation for breaking into Pacific Bell's offices. Uh, presumably he was trying to maybe figure out some stuff about how their systems worked. Um, he then enrolled at USC and used campus machines to perform illegal activities. Uh, he had six months in juvenile prison in Stockton, California. In 1987, he breaks into SCO, which we'll look at. Uh, he <laughs> then enrolled in another institution, uh, misused campus system, was expelled again. In 1988, he broke into DEC and stole software. He was caught by the FBI and he served a one year sentence in Lompoc. Uh, in 1992, he violated probation and went into hiding. <laughs> Uh, in 94, they issued a $1 million warrant for Mitnick's arrest. Look like at guys who can't quit. Um, in 1994, he was accused of hacking into the SD's, uh, the San Diego Supercomputing Center. So yeah, this is a pretty long list of crimes. Although if he was really good, would he get caught so much? I don't know. Um, but anyway, so the attack against the SDSC is actually really interesting. It was a super sophisticated TCP spoofing attack. And uh, we haven't, we will get into that. Um, it basically established it uh, exploited trust between two systems. So there was an X terminal, which was a system that did not have a disk. And there was a server that provided the boot image to that disk. So there was, the X server allowed unauthenticated logins coming from the server. So if you pretended, so, if you could break into the server, you could talk to this X server and the X terminal and get access. <coughs> so the first thing he did was say, okay, I want to try to impersonate the server, so I'm going to take it down. So he'd send a bunch of packets, send, cause a denial of service, cause it to crash, right, so the server can't respond. Then you impersonate server, you pretend to be the server, the X terminal thinks you're the server, and you can basically, this command uh, RSH is in the S terminal, Basically, this line adds allow everyone to RSH into this machine. Uh, so this is the .rhost file. Uh, and you can find out a lot more information about here into this attack. There's actually a lot of, apparently there's a lot of controversy here around was it actually him or was it somebody else? Um, I don't know. You can read this and kind of try to make up your mind. Uh, the story continues. Uh, in 95, <laughs> the FBI arrested him in North Carolina Finally, so what was that, like three years on the run? So I have, that's actually pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, well, 94, I have a year. Um, so then in January 2000, he was a re released from prison after five years, uh, which is a lot longer than RTM got, right? Um, and he had, uh, he was on probation, which forbid him from using a computer using the internet or from sending an email. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they still do that nowadays. But <laughs> it would be difficult. Like, I, You'd have to have somebody else do it for you. Like, I, what would you do? How would you talk to people? I don't know. Um, so finally, in January 2013, he could finally surf the internet after eight years. Uh, so he was a big part about hacking culture. So back around this time period, especially like 90s and 2000s, when people would take over a website, they'd put up pages that would say, like, free Kevin Mitnick and all this stuff. Like, he kind of became an underground hacking cultural icon. Um, now we get to kind of more recent stuff. So this is Albert Gonzalez. Uh, part of the goal of this class, well, the next session, will be to teach you not to end up like Albert Gonzalez. <laughs> <laughs> so he and his hacking crew used SQL injection vulnerabilities to steal credit cards. They were behind the uh, TJ Maxx hacks, and there was another thing, and Heartland uh, payment systems, which was actually a credit card processor, so they were able to get right there and steal all their credit cards. 
In total, they stole 170 million credit cards. That's the estimate. And so, what do you do with all those credit cards? Sell them. Sell them to who? Sell them to who? Do you buy stolen credit cards often? <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> what do you do with the credit card? Probably try to liquidate it into cash. How? So then, uh, buy stuff and return it? I don't know. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. Sell it on the dark net. Sell it on, well, what are they doing? <coughs> they want uh, illegal stuff, they want illegal drugs, so they buy illegal credit cards too. But how do you, so you're going to give me drugs if I give you a stolen credit card? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
addition, the other thing that's interesting, right, is he was an insider. Right? He was an administrator of the system, and then they fired him. And so he used his, so he should have been cut off, you know, all of his access, everything, but for whatever reason that wasn't done, and so it caused them a lot of harm. Uh, and the environment. So there's a lot, the web is kind of, web defacements have kind of gone down over the years, but they used to be a really big thing to prove you were cool and lead hacking crew. You would break into a website and put up an HTML page that was like, we are lead hackers. Um, or you'd say, free Kevin Mitnick, and we are lead hackers. And <laughs> there was, in the early 2000s, there was a wave of worms that was just insane. So these have names like uh, Ninda, Code Red, Slammer, some of the, I think, maybe the Slammer or Blaster would, uh, they would just spread incredibly fast. They would take advantage of vulnerabilities in micro, usually Windows systems, right? And every computer on the internet was running Windows. And so you, they would exploit vast numbers of machines in a small amount of time. Um, and Blaster's author was 18 years old, which kind of goes to the fact that kind of anybody can do this. And the last thing I want to end on more recent stories. So not only so, Albert Gonzalez is pretty recent, we have the OPM breach. The very interesting thing is the report from DHS and FBI that was released in December 2009 uh, called Grizzly Steep, uh, Russian <coughs> Militia Cyber Activity. So essentially what this report, it's very light on details, but what this report basically says is that, uh, let's see, I have the words here. So there, it describes Cyber operations attributed to, quote, Russian civilian and military intelligence services to compromise and exploit networks and endpoints associated with the U.S. election, as well as a range of U.S. government, political, and private sector entities. Have you heard this? How are all your names on that? <laughs> Probably a lot more. Yes. Um, and the interesting thing here is they detail two spear phishing attacks. Uh, so what's a spear phishing? What's a phishing attack? Is that where they send a fake email out? And do what? And try to lure you into like give your credentials to update something. Yeah, so I would spoof an email to you or send you an email and say, hey, this is Google. Um, you need to change your password. And you would click on that link, but instead of going to Google, you go to my web page that looks exactly like the Google change password page, and you type in your password to update everything. <coughs> um, what's so that's like broad Fishing, as I just send it out. What's spear phishing? It sounds a lot cooler. Yeah, it's it's so they're targeting like a high profile individual or organization. Yeah, so targeting. So now you can actually target the email that you're sending. Instead of a generic, hey, you don't have your email, they would send you, uh, hey, Adam, you need to change your password. And so it looks much more legitimate. They can even target it towards services that you're using. Uh, it's super interesting. So. There were two ones. One in the summer of 2015, they sent malicious link, so a link to a, a phishing website, to a thousand recipients, including legitimate domain. So uh, that's actually the interesting thing here. And I took this from the report, but I hate their wording here. I think what they mean to say is these links were, uh, the emails were sent from legitimate domains, and the links that they were sent to were also legitimate domains. So basically, they had exploited. Uh, what were known good servers in order to in order to perpetuate this spear phishing attack? So instead of seeing an email from some random person that you've never seen, the email is actually coming from a trusted domain. Yeah, it was a full stack. It was a what? Uh, fish, a spear phishing attack. A full stack. Yes. So yes, very sophisticated, which is pretty cool. I mean, cool to understand and learn. Then the most recent one was, and so they summer of 2016. They sent targeted spear phishing attacks, uh, tricking recipients into changing their passwords. So I have some screenshots for this. So this is apparently <coughs> an email that was sent uh, to say, so it says, uh, someone just use your password and try to log into your Google account. Uh, here are the details. Google stopped this sign on this tent. You should mean change your password immediately. So there's a change password button. When you click on that, it's not the Google thing. It's a bit.ly link. And if you go to this bit.ly link, um, you can see, so where's the link? Oh, they don't show it here, that's good. Uh, but you can see it's going to my account. So one thing is it's not HTTPS, that should be 
It's actually would be a first big indicator. You shouldn't put your password into something that's not HTTPS. So HTTP myaccount.google.com dash security setting page dot tk. <laughs> <laughs> and the other cool thing here is the security sign on options. Password equals this. FN and image. Which one? One of these. I thought I would be able to tell by looking at it. These are just. I think these are just base 64 encoded. Uh, one of these is the actual person's name and email. So that's what links the email that they sent. So they know which page to generate when you go do it. When you go do it, you can see the exact page. So you can see it looks just like Google. It has the person's <coughs> picture um, and email address. And so all it takes is you putting your password into here for these bad actors to steal it. So kind of an interesting question. If you saw something that looked like this, would you fall, would you put your password in? We all like to say we would not, but evidence says otherwise. <laughs> Any questions on this? This is a legit example of what I took. This is uh, the Podesta email attacks. Uh, acts. Okay, cool. We did all that. We talked about sad people who ended up in jail because they used their knowledge of computing systems to perpetuate fraud and to commit crimes. We need to talk about ethics. Okay, ethics is very broad. We're not going to talk about, well, we can talk about doing what's right. Uh, so what time is class going to 55? 50? 50? All right, we'll be good. Cool. 50. Okay, so avoiding jail. So. This is actually very critical because I want to make sure, so I need to make sure that, okay, we rephrase that. Uh, some people generally have a problem with some of the techniques that I teach you. Some people don't want people to be taught about offensive security techniques or uh, software vulnerabilities or exploitations. Uh, I firmly believe that this is incredibly important things to learn, but you have to commit, but the way I can teach this is by getting you all on board with the idea of doing this stuff ethically. Um, so avoiding jail, we all want to avoid jail. Does anybody want to go to jail? <laughs> no. no. Not, there's not a decent amount of foreign students in here. You don't want to do that. It's pretty easy. Don't do anything illegal. Yay. OK, we're done. Ethics stuff. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so in a hacking contest, what does this mean? So what do you think this means in the context of hacking? and security vulnerabilities and exploiting. Not exploiting. Not exploiting what? Other computers. Yes, others' computers. This is the key. So you can never, ever, ever hack into a system that you do not own or have permission. Right? And does that mean permission for me? <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> Do not attempt to find vulnerabilities, <laughs> even attempting to find vulnerabilities in a system that you do not own or you do not have permission is absolutely not permitted. Right? And this is something I do take very seriously because I can get in trouble with this, the university can get in trouble with this, you can get in trouble, I don't want anybody to get in trouble, I don't want to visit you in jail. <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that. So what this means is you, you can do anything you want to your own machines that you own. That is the beautiful part. You can't try to break into somebody else's machine just because you downloaded it and that exploit and can do stuff. Um, so, here's how to practice without going to jail. Download the source code onto your own server or system that you control. Right? Run the thing locally and try to find vulnerabilities in it. That's perfectly 100% possible. Uh, the other cool way, try to find vulnerabilities in a system that has a bug bounty program. So there are, uh, I think I have links in here to, there's lots of bug bounty programs. Facebook has them. Um, lots of others that I can't think of off the top of my head. GitHub, I think, has them. Where they say, hey, if you follow these rules, we give you permission to try to find vulnerabilities in our website. Then, as long as you follow those rules, you're totally good. The third way that's really cool is being academic. Um, so 
we can, sometimes as part of our research, we need to measure things, like how many websites out there are vulnerable to cross-site scripting or SQL injection, or uh, we just did a recent project on email header injection vulnerabilities. So we developed a system that actually went out and exploited these vulnerabilities, but we made sure to do it in a way that did not cause any harm, and that was ethically consistent. So, uh, you know, this is part of my job is to do this. So one way to do that is to work with me on research so you can do that stuff. Uh, bug bounty programs, lots of things. Uh, lots of sites do this. You can actually earn real dollars or fame from this. Um, you have to make sure that they give you permission and you must understand what's in scope. So yeah, these are just Google, Facebook, AT&T, Coinbase, Etsy, GitHub, Heroku, Microsoft, PayPal, the list goes on and on. Uh, Bugcrowd.com has a nice list of a bunch of bug bounty programs. So why is it important to follow the rules? So there's an incident at Facebook where a security researcher found a vulnerability on Facebook that allowed you to post on anyone's wall without being friends with them. That's a pretty serious vulnerability, right? Yes? Yes. Um, unfortunately, this researcher tried to communicate with the Facebook security team to let them know about this vulnerability, and there was an English barrier there. The person, uh, I think they were Turkish or something, uh, the, they weren't a native English speaker, they really weren't explaining themselves properly, plus the bug bounty people have like thousands of these reports, and a lot of them are garbage to go through, so uh, the communication broke down, and so the researcher then decided, well, I'll just post on Mark Zuckerberg's wall, <laughs> and that'll get it fixed. Uh, which it did, it got fixed in like, I think an hour or something. Uh, unfortunately, so even though he found a vulnerability that would have awarded him money, it had monetary value, Facebook was willing to pay for that. Um, Facebook said that, hey, you didn't follow the policy. Facebook actually has a super cool system where you can just sign up to be a security tester and you get your own version of Facebook. You can create accounts and do whatever you want on there. So you have a sandbox you can play in. And they specifically say in their terms, do not do anything on the real Facebook website. So this person violated those terms by doing this and thus wasn't eligible for the money. Uh, so kind of look at what it looks like. You can see here, uh, this guy says, Dear Mark Zuckerberg, first sorry for breaking your privacy and close to your wall. I had no other choice to make up after all the ports on the Facebook team. My name is blah, 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 and he probably says a little bit more about himself. Um, oh, yeah, so I have one here. So he's like reporting it on Zuckerberg's wall. So then this leads us to an interesting aspect of ethics here. So if you find a vulnerability in software, what is your vulner what is your responsibility? So put yourself in the shoes of a security researcher. I'm gonna give you the tools and knowledge to do this. You find a vulnerability in Chrome, what do you do? Report it to Google. What was that? Report to Google. Report it to Google. What else? Do you have any other options? Make it public. Sell it to someone that can use it. Sell it to someone. <laughs> <laughs> that is the third option. Um, yeah, so there's different ways of thinking about this. So the tell the world is full disclosure. So what's the benefit of telling the world? It gets you credit. It gets, you get credit, that's a good one. You get, it gets fixed, right? People will take this seriously. Why will it get fixed? Yeah, because once everybody knows, the bad guy knows too, and they will soon, very shortly, develop exploits for it. What's the downside? More breaking. What was that? More breaking. Yeah, you could be, you know, I mean, I'm not making a judgment call on any of these. I think, uh, you know, I lean more towards other types of disclosure, but I know some people do believe very strongly in full disclosure. You know, you are putting people at risk, right? People may, bad guys may take that information that you gain and cause harm with that, right? On the flip side, let's say you tell Google and they tell you to go away or they don't work with you, right? Then sometimes that's your only responsibility. That is the only avenue available to you to get things fixed. Um, the one I'm more in favor of is responsible, well, okay, so responsible disclosure is a very loaded term. It means that if you choose anything else, it's irresponsible, right? Um, I like to think of it as working with the company or group, so. You know, when you find something, I, I, so, okay. so when you find something, you try to work with the company. If you can't, then I'm totally on board with full disclosure. So that's kind of my personal ethics around this situation. You can kind of develop your own way. Uh, 
The other one is you can sell the information to the black and gray market. So the black market would be uh, selling it to a government that you know is going to use it against their citizens to evade their privacy or something. Uh, or even, well, that would be more gray, I guess, depending uh, on your definition. But black market could be like selling it that is an exploit to hackers who are definitely going to use it to cause exploits. Ultimately, it's a personal decision. Um, I'm a firm believer in responsible disclosure, giving them enough time to fix it. It's uh, one of these things where you as a researcher, you found this thing, you want, really want to get it fixed, but, uh, and you know, because the flip side is, let's say it takes the company three months to develop a patch for this. Well now, you knew about this three months ago, and let's say it's being actively exploited, but nobody knows about it. Now you cause basically three months of people that if you had gone full disclosure, would have been fixed. Um, so you kind of have to weigh those options. On the other hand, when you're talking about software like Windows, the amount of testing they, that goes into Windows is insane. Like they test it on all types of hardware, like the test matrix just is crazy. So it can take you know two or three months to effectively roll out a patch. Um, you know, most companies are good, and a lot of the good thing that I've seen is if you decide to eventually go full disclosure, you have a section there that says what steps you try to take and when to talk to the company uh, to prove that you kind of try to do your part. Okay, final thing I want to talk about. Oh, that I've lost time. Ah, we got one more thing. All right. Would you hire a hacker? So would you hire Kevin Mitnick to secure your network? <laughs> Pros, cons, what do you think? They have an attacker mindset, so they understand yeah. attackers. They, they know the attacker's mindset, right? Pros, yeah? Yeah, they don't even know defense, right? They could maybe, uh, you know, there's a, definitely a link there, but I don't think it goes one to one. Just because you know how to attack something means you know how to defend. Questionable uh, motives and their costs. Yeah, questionable <laughs> motives. They've already gotten caught for committing fraud, right? Maybe their ethical compass is all messed up. Um, you know, why would you want that person to come? Yeah, you wouldn't be able to fire him. Yeah, exactly. How would you fire this person? Maybe they put back doors. Maybe they're going to open sewage gates as soon as you fire them. Right? <laughs> it's an open problem. Uh, yeah. So this is kind of a con in a succinct way. I don't want to hire an arsonist to be the fire marshal. Yeah, they may know a lot about starting fires, but you know their <laughs> job responsibilities may be at odds with their personal interests. Um, anyways, people are hired a lot. Uh, Kevin Mitnick has his own consulting firm if you want to hire him for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, close on if you want to hire, sorry, and this will actually tie back into Joaquin's talk uh, last week on Wednesday. Legal hacking, penetration testing is a profession where you are hired by companies to break into their systems. Uh, so you perform vulnerability analysis, which we're going to study in this class, and followed by actual exploitation. So you demonstrate to the company, look, these are what we could do. Um, it's usually black box, where you don't have access to their source code, so it's simulating a real attacker. Uh, it's part of processes. Yeah, all right, we'll stop here. Thanks, everyone. See you on Monday. Yeah, I realize I missed it.